thankful to have this opportunity this morning to, to preach a lesson. Uh, I'm thankful for those those thoughts that Brandon brought. Uh, I like the, the fact that our children are asking those questions. He presented those Lord's Supper thoughts. The fact that these children are asking those t- type of questions. Isn't it great? And I'm thankful to God uh, for the parents that go here and for the teachers of these little children that they're asking those questions and want to know more about God and want to know more about His Son and our Savior. And I've been working on this this lesson for a while. We'll be reading from Daniel chapter 5, if you'd like to turn there. Daniel chapter 5 is where we're going to be studying from this morning. I've been working on this lesson for about three to three or four months. Uh, it's, it's, I've had it somewhat put together in my head. And, uh, um, I'm just happy to have this opportunity to speak to you guys, to share with you this lesson. And I think one, one thing I thought about, when I'm sitting down there in the crowd, a lot of times the, the men up here that aren't the preacher, they say, well, I'm not the preacher. And I always think that's funny. And one thing that's in, my, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, you are today. <laughs> And I'm not the preacher today, <laughs> but I am today. Um, if you turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5, uh, one thing, I'll mention this about, about Megan. She is my best audience. She, she often, uh, this is probably her third time to hear this, uh, but she does really good, gives me a lot of good feedback. Um, and she's the one who told me that my introduction, she, I needed more to it. So I haven't even got to my introduction yet. <laughs> but anyway, um, in all of that, we're going to be reading out of Daniel chapter 5. Another thing that she gave me some feedback on is a lot of times as I read David instead of Daniel. If we're in Daniel chapter 5, if I say David, just strike that and just hear Daniel. Because we're, we're talking about Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, and that's where we're at. Now, six years ago was the first time I've ever spoke, uh, done a lesson in front of a crowd. And it was this crowd. It was a much smaller crowd at that time, six years ago. It was on a Sunday evening. And, you know, it's scary. Since then, I've gotten a little bit better up here. But my knees are knocking, you know, hands shaking. I, I try to keep my hands down for the first part of the lesson because if I bring them up, people start seeing that they're shaking. Um... And i tell you one other quick story is we had this congregational singing back in August and everything was moved around for a while and I knew my lesson was coming up toward in, in this time in October and for a while, if y'all remember, this uh, Lord's Supper table was up here and there was nothing for me to hide behind. And I started noticing that I started getting fearful even then, seeing that oh, I hope they get everything moved back and luckily... <laughs> Luckily, y'all will see just my face from now on. Um, bringing up that story, is we're going to read about a man whose knees were knocking. We're going to read about a guy who was really scared, and he was shaking. And I want to read his whole story. And his whole story is recorded to us in Daniel chapter 5. And his name is Belshazzar. And as we go through uh, Daniel chapter 5, I want us to think of three things. I want us to think, where is our focus? Where is our focus? Is our focus on God? Second thing is I want to think about, who do we look to for spiritual help? Who do we look to for help with spiritual issues? And the third thing is, what is our response to the truth in God's Word? What is the response when we are faced with the hard truth in God's Word? Now, real quickly, where are we at in Daniel chapter 5? In Daniel chapter 5, uh, we're, we're in the captivity period, the Babylonian captivity. And I share this with, with Sam and Davis. When we're Sam and Davis are really good so far. They can go through the 17 Bible periods. And they do uh, really well. They know them forward, uh, and they, they get mad at me because now I'm trying to make them learn them backwards. So, but they know them forward really well. And when we get to the United Kingdom, we do like this. You know, I, I do a lot of hand motions, but United Kingdom. And this is when you learn about King Saul and King David. This is where David is, not, not Daniel. But King David and, and King Solomon, and then the divided kingdom. And we talk about the divided kingdom and how they uh, didn't do what God uh, instructed them to do. The northern kingdom of Israel 
worse than the, the southern kingdom of Judah. And they were taken away. So we were left with the next Bible period is Judah alone. And Judah stood alone for a few years. And then they were taken away into captivity. Later to return, where we're at in Daniel chapter 5, we're still in the Babylonian captivity. So uh, we're in the Babylonian captivity over here. And we've already read of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, They were three of the ones that were left in Judah alone, taken with Daniel into captivity with him. And the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were sent into that fiery furnace uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar and saved. Uh, An angel walked among them and pulled out of there, not even... They were not burnt a bit, so they were fine. God had saved them. And Nebuchadnezzar at that time was seeing the power of this God. And later in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had proclaimed uh, praise and honor for God. But Daniel chapter 5 is a few years later. Nebuchadnezzar has died and we have either his son or his grandson, Belshazzar, has started reigning. And we're going to begin reading in chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. And in that same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote and then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosed and his knees knocked against each other Belshazzar was scared Belshazzar was drinking from stolen vessels from the people of Jerusalem And he was drinking from these stolen vessels with his wives and concubines. And he was praising not the God that his father Nebuchadnezzar knew and proclaimed. He was praising the God of gold and the God of silver. Belshazzar had lost that focus. He had lost focus on the God that his father had known. And what did he do when he saw that writing on the wall? When that hand was started writing on the wall, he got scared. He was very scared. He didn't know what to do. What do I do? I mean, if we saw a hand writing on the wall, it would be pretty scary. And that was his thought. I'm scared. What do I need to do? Who do I need to turn to? Well, let's continue reading in verse 7 through 9 and see who Belshazzar turned to. In verse 7 through 9. Verse 7 it says, The king cried aloud to each of the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. Who did Belshazzar turn to? He turned to the wise men. He turned to the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. He turned to people of of the world. He didn't turn to the people of God. He just turned to his people, the people of the world that he knew. Did he find the answer he was looking for? 
I was actually, uh, Davis, uh, Sam was my audience member last night, and I asked that question. He said, no. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't find what he was looking for. Well, let's continue reading in verse 10 through 17. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy and whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in with found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard this, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel went to the wrong people. But we have people that he was around that knew of the people of God that he could go to. The queen was aware of Daniel. And we'll read a little bit further that even Belshazzar knew of Daniel. He knew that Daniel was out there. And Belshazzar, unlike people of the world sometimes, he was not... um, when, When he asked Daniel to provide this interpretation, Daniel wasn't looking to be elevated. He wasn't looking to have a closer friendship developed with the king. Um... Daniel was a man of God. He was a man of prayer. He was a man that was just there. He said, I'll interpret them. I'm not trying to raise my position, but you've you've called on the right guy. And he's come to deliver the message that that has come from God. And we'll continue reading through verse 28. Verses 18 through 28. O King, the Most High God, King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a king, <clears throat> the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And because of the majesty he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whoever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whoever, whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the seas of men. His heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was like the wild donkeys, and they fed him with grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over whomever he chooses. But you, his son, and Belshazzar have not humbled your heart although you knew all of this and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven you have brought the vessels of his house before you you and your lords your wives and your concubines and you have drunk wine from them you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron wood and stone which do not see or hear or know and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him and the writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. 
This is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and been found wanting. You Farson, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Wow, it's kind of a hard, hard hitter for Belshazzar. Uh, this is one of those times Daniel said, Hey, here's the truth. You have done wrong. You, the God who holds your life, and the God who has given you every power that you have, your breath and your ways are in His hand, and you have not glorified Him. The choice is yours, Belshazzar. The choice is yours. You you gotta you have to glorify God or not glorify God. Your kingdom is finished. You've been weighed. You've been weighed on the scales and you don't measure up. Basically, you don't measure up. God has set a standard. You don't meet that standard, Belshazzar. You do not meet it. And one last thing is he said, You don't have any excuse. You don't have an excuse. Your father, you knew of your father Nebuchadnezzar. You knew of his um, proclaiming this God. And you still were not humbled. And you did not glorify God. I want to end the chapter and I want to think about what was Belshazzar's response. How did he respond to this hard truth? Daniel hit him with some hard things right here. Put him to the test. I want to continue and finish the chapter. Then Belshazzar gave the command. They clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years his immediate reaction was to do exactly what he was going to do with Daniel in the first place. I just need an answer. Give me an answer and then we'll go on. He got his answer. He clothed Daniel up and, and elevated his position. That was his choice. Now, he was, he was told, you need to glorify God. You need to humble yourself and glorify God. And I want to contrast that with the, with the Ninevites. When Jonah went to the people of Nineveh, when he went to that country that was wicked, and God said, I am going to, I'm going to destroy you. I want to read just a quick passage from Jonah uh, chapter 3. And contrast Belshazzar's response to these people of Nineveh. The people of Nineveh believed God after Jonah preached to them. And they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he cried out and said in Nineveh, By decree of the king and his great one, saying, Do not let man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them feed nor drink water, but let man and animal be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. And let each one turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows, he may repent and God may have pity and turn away from the glow of his anger so that we do not perish. And God saw their works and they turned from their evil way and God was compassionate over the evil that he said he was going to do to them and he did not do it. Now their response was to, their immediate response was to fall down before this God and recognize their sin and turn and God did not destroy them. Uh, just real quickly, in, in Daniel chapter 3, after Shadrach and uh, Meshach and Abednego, uh, in verse 28, after Nebuchadnezzar saw what happened to them and they came out of that fiery furnace, after he recognized that this is, this is the one true God, here's his response here. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, that they have frustrated the king's word, and they have yielded their bodies, and that they should not worship, not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, 
nation or language that speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Now I want you to contrast those responses. The king in Nineveh, King Nebuchadnezzar, with Belshazzar. He just clothed Daniel, gave him some new clothes, elevated his position. And then what happened? That very night, that very night, Belshazzar was slain for his deeds. He was destroyed. He did not make the right choice. I want to think about how do we apply this this story in our lives. And we'll go back to the questions that I was asking. Where where is our focus? Where is our focus today? Is our focus on glorifying God? Now, uh, we don't... We live in a very similar time, it sounded like, as Belshazzar. Belshazzar had all of this food and wine and plenty of things, and they were serving gods of gold and silver. Now, I don't think any of us serve gods of gold and silver. But if you drive down 280, I guarantee you, usually there's a guy out there with a sign wanting your gold. And there's a guy out there wanting your silver. And if you turn on commercials, there's a lot of people talking about gold and silver. It's really important in this community, or in this, in this, um, in our um, country. And there's a lot of entertainment. Any kind of entertainment, we've got it. This country is full of all sorts of different entertainment. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying some of this entertain, all of this entertainment is bad. We've got a lot of things that we enjoy doing. There's a lot of things that we can enjoy doing. But if we let our focus on God go all entertainment, all gold or silver, if all of our focus is pulled in one direction, our focus is not on glorifying God. And that's where our focus needs to be, is on glorifying God. Satan, Satan is out there like a roaring lion. He's pulling us every chance he gets. He'll try to find something that will pull you this way and pull you away from our God. Who do we turn to for spiritual help? If we have lost that focus, if there's something that's, that, that we have an issue with, if we're struggling in some area, who do we turn to for help? If we take our problems, if we take our issues to people of the world, you know, what kind of answers do we expect to get? If we take them... If we don't take them to God, if we take them to our friends and people that are are not in our church family, if we take them to the people of the world, what kind of answers do we expect to get? That's a problem sometimes that people take them away. And that's the wrong direction. They're going to get worldly answers. I remember probably about three years ago I was driving. I'm a, I'm a, talk, a talk radio person. I, I, I listen to talk radio all the time. I, I like it. it. It helps me on long drives. But I was listening. This was late at night coming back from, from probably Plant Vogel over in, in Georgia. Um, but I think it was, I think her name was Dr. Laura. It's a, you know, she was a marriage counselor, I guess, on the radio or something like that. And I couldn't believe the worldly answers that this lady was giving to people that called in. Called in, my husband did this or this or this. Well, you need to just get rid of him. You know, really. You know, just flat out it was, or, or, he, or he or she did something. Well, you need to find a way that you can, you know, show them that you can do that too. You know, to make things equal. And it just bored me that some of these answers were coming on the radio like that. These, these worldly answers. And, and it, it, it just, it's what happens sometimes when we go to worldly people. Or we go to people that just want to be our friends. They, they, they want to be elevated in that position with you or something. Their response is a lot of times, it's not, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It, it's their fault. And you know, sometimes that is the case. Sometimes it may be somebody else's fault. But a lot of times, if we have something in, that we're struggling with, there's a reason why we're struggling with it, we need to recognize that we are at fault. We need to work on those things. And if we go to these people, we need to uh, not go to these people of the world, but do what the Bible instructs us to do, is go to God in prayer. 
and go to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we're, we're studying 1 Corinthians. We haven't gotten to chapter 6 yet, but Paul's telling these people, you are taking your brother and sister to court sometimes to people of the world. Why can't you find a wise man amongst yourself to help help in that situation? And, and we have a Christian family that we can come to for whatever issues or struggles we may be having. We have a family here that will surround you with prayers and help you with that struggle. So what is our response to the truth and God's Word? God holds your breath, not just Belshazzar's. He holds your breath and your ways in His hand. He's got them in His hand. Everything that you have, everything that you've been given, God has given you. And God's Word tells us that we have to humble ourselves and recognize that that He holds your life within His hand. And God's Word tells us of a plan to save humanity through His Son, Jesus Christ, as we remember His sacrifice just a while ago. God's Word tells us that we can have those sins washed, that we can be set apart to glorify God. We can be set apart from the world to glorify God And it tells us how we can be justified. God's Word tells us that we we must be faithful unto death, focused on shining our lights before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our focus on God is for us, but it's also so that others will see that focus on God and glorifying God and they will see that and that they will also glorify your Father which is in heaven. The writing on the wall this morning, the writing on the wall is that we need to be focused on glorifying our God, glorifying the God that holds our life breath in His hand. We need to be focused on that God. And we need to continue to be united as a church family focused on glorifying God and doing His will. Do you know this morning, there may be ones among you, do you know this God? If you don't know this God who is in control of all things, this invitation is for you. If you don't know that our purpose, if you don't know our purpose in life, is to glorify God. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to be here to recognize God and to glorify Him. And if you don't know that this morning, this invitation is for you. You can come forward and we can help you to learn more about our God. If you have lost focus, if if there's some struggle that has pulled you away from God, we have this time if you want to gain more of that focus we have this time right now this invitation is for any who want to come back and if they want to just come forward this church family I know from experience you know if you have an issue if you have a struggle and you come forward this church family will surround you with love they'll surround you with prayers they'll surround you with encouragement it is something that that our church family can do and we do it through God because we're all focused on glorifying God so if you've if you've struggled if you've had something pull you away this invitation is for you today how will you respond I'll go quickly back to Belshazzar Belshazzar had a choice he had a choice to glorify God or to not glorify God And that very night, it says in verse 30, that very night he was slain. He made the wrong choice. This morning, don't wait too late to make things right with God. We have a time to respond as we stand and sing.